Jeremiah chapter 11, and one last thing I will say before we get started. In my Bible is the uh, the order of service from Frank Ham's uh, uh, funeral service, and I love this. And this is uh, this is a Salvation Army thing because he he has a heritage uh, with the Salvation Army going back, I think, to at least two generations that I'm aware of. Um, and I don't know if the Salvation Army was around before then, so I don't know. But uh, at any rate. Uh, at the front, it says, promoted to glory. I love that. And, and uh, they had a flag over the casket that had that on the front of it, promoted to glory. What a cool way to think about moving on. Because that's exactly what it's all about. This world is not your home. Don't, don't get too comfortable. Because you've got to move. And in fact... Moving is a great experience because this isn't like when you moved and you got to rent the truck and you got to get five or six people to help you and only one or two of them show up and you got to feed them pizza to keep them going, right? And stuff gets put in the wrong place and there's always one very valuable, precious thing that Aunt Jane gave me 50 years ago that ends up in pieces and someone's going, I'm really sorry I kicked that down the stairs. It's not like that at all. The way Paul describes it is he says, being a tent maker, that was his trade, he used that imagery and he says, someday I'm going to fold up this tent. The day is coming when this tent, this body, is going to wear out. And I'm just going to fold it up. And then I'm moving into a house. A house not made with hands. A house made by the Lord. A house that Jesus talked about. He said, hey, it's good that I go away. You're, you're sad that I'm going to leave you guys, but it's good that I go away because I go away to prepare a place for you so that I will come again and take you to be with me so that you can be with me forever. Moving out of a tent into a house that sounds pretty good to me. Don't get too comfortable with this world. It will suck the life out of you. It will divert you from the truth and the goodness of Jesus Christ. And it will blind your eyes and make you think, I I'm, things are good, I'm happy, everything's cool. And if you could just step out. It reminds me of when I used to play country music in bars and I didn't quite make it to Nashville I made it to Knoxville that's the same state begins with a K and I can still remember the 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 one bar that I played in Yosemite Sam's and you go in there at night it was a cool place it was a very cool place. I mean, lots of lights around and they had a great stage area in the back and this buddy of mine and I used to uh, play there uh, four, I think when I was down there, maybe four nights a week, something like that. And uh, we'd do the early set acoustic stuff and then they'd bring, the, bring in the, uh, the full band after us and stuff. And it, it was happening. And, and there were several... Uh, uh, promoters who were inviting us to go on to Nashville, but I was recently saved. It's interesting thinking back on it now because it was within about two weeks of getting saved that this friend of mine who had moved to Knoxville and we'd played music together years before called and said, hey, this is it. I, I, got, I got a great connection here. Well, this is what I've, you know, music is what I've always wanted to do. Sure, I'll go. Having just been saved and then and then walking in and going through this whole experience of learning what uh, playing music in bars is all about. Uh, it, it's about selling beer and whiskey. That's what it's about. The owners don't care if you're any good. They care if people buy more whiskey while you're there or if more people come. That's what it's all about. And it's no different today. And I learned that. But what I saw was, you know, you come in and the place is just nice. It's it, it's relaxing. It's, it's great. You know, people happening. And then they asked me, I need a little extra money because I didn't pay a whole lot. Uh, they asked me if I'd be willing to come in and do some painting for them during the day. And I said, sure, I will. And so I went in during the day when the sunlight 
was coming through the few windows that were there, and they turned on the, the lights instead of the bar lights. And I went, this is a dive. This is a dump. This, I can't believe I'm, I, I sat on that chair. Oh. My eyes were open to see what it was. I pray to God that each one of us might be able to have our eyes open to what this world really is because that's what it's like. You open your eyes and see, man, you know what? This world that looks so snazzy and cool and all this great stuff, it's a dump. It's been ruined by sin. Sandy mentioned the fact that when we came back down from Canada, we stopped at, at Niagara Falls on both sides of the, of the border. And it's beautiful and it's spectacular. And it is spoiled. It's spoiled by sin like this whole world has been. As beautiful as that is, it's just a glimpse of what true goodness and beauty is in the Lord. May we all know that and come to realize that. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your grace and Your goodness, for Your love and Your mercy. Lord, we thank You so much that You sent Your Son solely that You might clean up the mess that we humans have made by choosing sin instead of You. And to make the way that in this life we might be saved from Your wrath. And that we might enter into the next life in Your presence forever. Lord, this morning as we look to Your Word, help us to hear what Your Spirit is speaking to us this morning. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Israel had committed to following the Lord. They'd done it several times. I was really glad that I watched Pastor Tim on Facebook because I then had to edit my message and take out about a third of it because he preached it for me already. And thank you. At Sinai, as Pastor Tim recalled for you, at Sinai, Moses came down from the mountain at God's direction and said, this is what God is requiring. This is the covenant. This is the arrangement God has for you. And they all said, we will follow every word. Just before entering into the promised land, and it's found in the book of Deuteronomy, it happened again. And there were some special instructions given that time that I'll come back to in a second. And they said, yes, we will follow. Yes, we will do this. At the end of the conquest, the first conquest of the promised land under Joshua, he, they again committed themselves. In the time that we're talking about, we've been studying in the book of Jeremiah, Josiah, that good king, found a copy of the Torah, the law, in the temple. It had been lost and back in the back and no one had been following it. They hadn't celebrated Passover for quite some time. They found this book of the law. They brought it out. He read it in front of everybody at a pillar and outside the temple. And they said, we will follow this. We will do this. Unfortunately, in every case, it lasted only so long. Israel knew the benefits of following and the consequences of not following the covenant. They knew it specifically. You don't need to turn there, but if you write in your Bible, you might jot down these scripture references. Deuteronomy 27 and Joshua 8. And what you will find there if you go and read it is in Deuteronomy 27 and several chapters following that, 
Moses gives instructions to the people of Israel and tells them, look, when you get into the land, when you find the rest that I'm promising you in the promised land, here's what you need to do. You need to set up half of the people in front of Mount Ebal and half of the people in front of Mount Gerizim. And in the middle, you stand and you read every word of this law and you read these things. Blessed is the man who follows this covenant. And then in very specific ways. Blessed is the man who does this. Blessed is the man who does that. Cursed is the man who does this. Cursed is the man who does that. And all of those in Mount Ebal, when they would say, Cursed is the man who does this, they would yell out, Amen! And when they said something about blessing, all those in front of Mount Gerizim would say, Amen! Amen is a word we use a lot. We use it to say, okay, we're finished praying now and now we move on to something else. You know, or uh, we do it a little bit here and you're welcome to do it at, at any time that's appropriate. In our, uh, in our black gospel choir, you hear it a lot when I start sharing as the chaplain a little bit or uh, our leader begins to get really uh, into the Lord and begins to share some things and people be going, Amen! Amen. Oh, bring it on. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. Well, what the word amen means is so be it. Yes. That's my stamp of approval. I agree. Amen. That's why it's important. Paul talks about the fact of when we pray, we need to pray. When we're praying in a group situation, we need to pray in a way that other people understand what you're talking about so that they can say amen. If they don't hear you, if they don't understand the language that you're speaking, then how can they say amen? Because they have no idea what you just said. Right? Amen. That's right. We will do it. We will do it. Israel knew the blessing that was before them and the consequences of not following. And that brings us to chapter 11. Now I need to give you a little bit of history real quick here. Because we've talked about Josiah, and I mentioned him again. Great king, reformation, but not revival in the land. And most of what we've read up through the book of Jeremiah to this point, most scholars believe was during the time of Josiah. But now we jump to a different time, probably. It's not specifically identified. But most scholars believe that the next three chapters happened during the reign of a guy named Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. Josiah died, was killed by the Egyptians. Suddenly, nobody expected this to happen. He was a godly king. They thought, oh man, whatever he's going to do, God's going to bless him. But he was doing something that God didn't want him to do. And God didn't bless him and he got shot and he died. And his son, teenage son, was put in his place and lasted three months before Pharaoh Necho came, deposed him, put somebody else in his place, another one of Josiah's sons, half-brother to Jehoahaz, and then took Jehoahaz prisoner down to Egypt, and Israel became a vassal of the empire of Egypt. At this time, the two empires were Egypt to the south and west, and Babylon was beginning to rise up to the north and east, and right in between is Israel and some other lands. And they were vying for who's going to be toughest. And during the reign of the next guy, the guy that the Egyptian put in place, Jehoiakim, during his 11-year reign, Egypt was beaten. At first, Israel was their vassal. Then Egypt was beaten at the Battle of Carchemish. And Babylon became the empire that began to grow and grow and grow. And Israel became a vassal of Babylon and the first Babylonian captivity happened during his reign where Nebuchadnezzar came in and he took some things out of the temple and he took some of the highest and noblest people in the land. One of them by the name of Daniel and three of his friends and a number of others. This guy Jehoiakim wanted nothing to do with the Lord. Here he is, one of Josiah's kids. Josiah was a righteous and good man. But you know what? Your kids make their own choices. 
We are called to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. But they make their own choices. We need to be careful to do our part. And Jehoiakim made the choice not to follow the Lord. And he brought... Josiah had wiped out idolatry, had literally gone throughout the land and destroyed all the shrines and all the poles and all the different places where they practiced idolatry, destroyed them, burned them, got rid of them. And Jehoiakim brought them all back in. Let's go back and let's do this some more. And so we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, Obey my voice and do according to all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may establish the oath which I have sworn to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. And I answered and said, So be it, Lord. Amen. Then the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done. And the Lord said to me, a conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will surely bring calamity on them, which they will not be able to escape. And though they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods to whom they offer incense, but they will not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, you've set up altars to that shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. So, do not pray for this people, or lift up a cry or a prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble. What is my beloved to do in my house, having done lewd deeds with many? And the holy flesh has passed from you. When you do evil, then you rejoice. The Lord called your name green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it, and its branches are broken. For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. Now the Lord gave me knowledge of it, and I know it, or literally what it says is, now the Lord gave me knowledge, and I know, for you showed me their doings. But I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter. I did not know what they had advised schemes against me, saying, Let's destroy the tree with its fruit and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may not be remembered. But, O Lord of hosts, you who judge righteously, testing the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have revealed my cause. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the men of Anathoth, who seek your life, saying, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and there shall be no remnant of them, for I will bring catastrophe on the men of Ananoth, even the year 
of their punishment. Conspiracy. There's a conspiracy going on. Jesus, God pointed it out. There's a conspiracy. What was the conspiracy? Well, first of all, in verse 9, take a look at it. It says, The Lord said to me, A conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah, among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words, and they've gone after other gods. Here Josiah had wiped things clean, and yet what does the Lord through Jeremiah point out? But now you've got just as many gods as you have cities. You've got a separate god per city. You've got one for Hollywood. You've got one for Las Vegas. You've got one for New Orleans. You've got a special one for New York City, maybe two or three. You've got one for Pittsburgh. People set up gods, that which they will worship, that which they will give their time, their treasure, their talent to, that which they will spend their time with, give of themselves to apart from God. That is another God because it is being placed before Him. The first commandment. I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. On each street, they'd set up an altar. That's what he says. So quickly they had come back. This wasn't just a king and his power being able to... The guy was only in power for 11 years. He couldn't have accomplished all that just by decree. This was in the heart of the people. It was a conspiracy. What's a conspiracy? I don't know what the legal definition is. But as I understand what a conspiracy is, biblically here, it is the gathering together of more than one person for the same evil purpose. It's a conspiracy. It wasn't just Jehoiakim. It wasn't just this guy and that guy. It was everybody. It was everybody. It was a conspiracy to go back to the sins of their fathers. Jehoiakim reinstituted idol worship. He followed anything he desired. And there was a conspiracy against Jeremiah himself. That's what he was talking about in verses 18 through the end of the chapter. This is one of the places where we find there was a physical conspiracy against Jeremiah to kill him. Hey, stop prophesying in the name of the Lord or I'm going to kill you. And here's the thing. That, that land, Ananoth, that's his hometown. If you were to go back to the very first verse of the book, it says that's where he's from. It was a place that was populated, begun by a guy by the name of Abiathar. Abiathar was a high priest during the time of David. David and Zadok were the two high priests. Abiathar was a righteous man and yet at one point in time during the, the fightings over who was going to be in charge, Abiathar sided against David. It was for that reason that when Solomon became king, he banished Abiathar and said, no, you go, you go away. And he settled in Ananoth and that was where the, his people and other priests lived. So that by the time of Jeremiah, it says the priest that lived in Ananoth. It was a grouping of priests. It was his own people. It was other priests. Jeremiah was a priest by descent, but he was called to be a prophet, as Tim was saying last week. And his own people are out to kill him because he's speaking in the name of the Lord. He was not popular. He was not popular because here was Israel saying, well, God's going to get rid of this, 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 this pagan Egypt. This pagan Babylon. God's not going to let His temple be touched. This is where His name resides, even though we do whatever we want. His name is on our lips, but far from our heart. And Jeremiah said, no, no, unless you repent, he's going to come in here. He's going to destroy you. 
He's going to kill a bunch of you. He's going to take many others and scatter them to the nations. And what you really need to do is you need to submit to Babylon. That's what Jeremiah's message was. It wasn't popular. Can you imagine among all the talking heads that show up on all the different news channels, there being someone on there who said that what we need to do is we need to surrender ourselves to some other country. How do you think that would go over in most of America today? Not too well. Might get ratings for a while just because people are going, is that what he's really saying? But it wouldn't last long, huh? That's, what Jer- that's where Jeremiah was. He was alone. He was alone. And so we we come to the thought I wanted you to consider today. It's in chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet, let me talk with you about your judgments. Now, now, Now catch the tone that he's saying here. Lord, you are righteous. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. You are righteous, Lord. But let's talk about some of your judgments. There's something I just got to tell you, Lord. And then he gets to the crux of it. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? You have planted them. Yes, and they've taken root. They grow. Yes, they bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. But you, O Lord, know me. You have seen me. You've tested my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the herbs of the field wither? The beasts and the birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there because they said he will not see our final end. He's talked about the fact that this, there's this conspiracy against him and he likens it to all these priests in Ananoth want to come and they're going to cut down this tree of the Lord, Jeremiah. And he says, but Lord, let me ask you a question. Why are the wicked prospering? Why, why are they happy? Why are they? Well, you've planted them. They've taken root. They're healthy. They're bearing fruit. Here they want to kill me, and you've tested me. You know my heart. You know I love you. You know I've given everything to you. You know I would do anything for you, Lord. Why is this? Lord, this covenant, back in Deuteronomy 27, Lord, if we do good and follow the covenant, we'll be blessed. We'll have good times. We'll have all that we need. Things will be bountiful. Well, that's what I'm doing, Lord. I'm following you. And yet, I'm not feeling bountiful. And Lord, I see all these people. They're not following you. They've never graced the door of a church. They curse your name. That's the only time they use your name, is to curse. They're wicked, and yet, boy, they're they're established. They're 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 healthy. They're man, their life looks pretty great to me. I watch it on ETV, and they look man, they look happy. They look great. This is a question for the ages. This is a question that David struggled with. This is a question that Asaph struggled with. This is a question I'll bet you've struggled with at one time or another in your life. And if not, get ready, because it's going to come. The time will come when you will look at your own life and you will say, I'm following the Lord, and and this is so tough. And I look at the wicked and, man, they got it easy. Turn back to the Psalms. Psalm... 73. And this is Asaph dealing with the same question. 
Psalm 73. Asaph puts it this way. He says, truly God is good to Israel. Amen, brother. Hallelujah. To such as is pure in heart. Okay. Pure in heart, God is good to me. But, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death. Their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. Ever felt like that? If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Do you catch what he's saying here? His jealousy foreseeing the prosperity of the wicked. And in his heart he said, In vain I have tried to follow you, Lord, and I've tried to be pure in heart, and I've washed my hands in innocence, and and yet I'm plagued all the day long, and they're not. And if I had had kept speaking like this, thinking like this, I would have been untrue to the generations of your children, to generation upon generation upon generation of people following you, Lord. I would have been untrue to that, but it was too hard for me to figure out. Man... Christians have been following Jesus for 2,000 years. They've been giving their life for Him. And here I am going, but why is it so hard for me? And so easy for the wicked. If I whine and complain like that, I'm being untrue to those generations, to those ones who went singing hymns to their death. But, But still I have this feeling in my heart, this isn't fair. God, you said you blessed me. I don't feel blessed right now. But then, when he entered into the sanctuary, God met with him. And what did he see? He saw the end of the wicked. He saw the end of the path. You see, Jesus described it this way. Broad is the way to destruction. Oh, it's smooth. It's got nice bright lights. Boy, it's got fancy things on either side of the street. And many there are who find it. But narrow is the way and straight is the gate that leads to eternal life and few there are who find it. God didn't say, I'm going to give you a super highway. Just set your cruise control to 80 and just put it Kick back and enjoy. No, he said, kick in the four-wheel drive, get the wipers going full blast, and strap yourself in because you're in for a ride. That's what God promises us. That's His promise. But the question is, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? 
Where are you headed? The path is not descriptive of the end. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, Asaph says. I was like a beast, just like a wild animal before you. Hmm. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none that I desire on this earth but you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You're headed somewhere. Everyone is headed somewhere. We get a choice in this life as to where we want to head. We have the good news that our good shepherd will follow the path to eternity. And if we follow him, that's where we go. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you made it so cushioned, nice and comfortable for me. No, because you are with me. Still in the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But fear not, I'm with you. I've overcome the world. How did Jesus overcome the world? Think about it. He surrendered Himself to death by pagan, ungodly people. A horrible, shameful death that we cannot imagine by these little things we wear around our neck. Horrible, bloody, stinking, shameful, wicked, awful way to die. Hmm. And that's how He leads us there. You see, Jesus said, if you don't pick up your cross daily and follow Me, you have no place with Me. Jesus said that? Man, that, that, sounds, that sounds so hard. That doesn't sound loving at all. It's the greatest love. It's the greatest love. Jesus made His way to the Father through the cross and looks to us and says, pick up your cross daily and follow Me because the way will lead you to life. Don't get comfortable in this world. The pleasures of this world are a moment. They're a rest stop along the Broadway straight to hell. Instead, the narrow way, the straight gate. I love the Lord. He is so good. And He has been so good to me. His loving kindness and His grace are immeasurable. Don't be deceived. God is a consuming fire. His wrath will be poured out upon injustice and unrighteousness in ways that we can't imagine. In ways that people today are struggling with the concept of hell because they say, well, it, that's not loving. That's not graceful. But that's the Word of God. You have a choice when you face something hard in the Word of God. Believe it or reject Him. That's the choice you have, really. I believe it. And it says that there is awaiting those who reject Him horrible consequences and blessings to those who now will surrender to Him. 
And sometimes we can find ourselves like Jeremiah saying, but Lord, I'm following You. And i got people that are plotting to kill me. My own countrymen. Nobody believes me. Nobody wants to hear me. This is nothing but hard. I just want to weep all the time. Because my heart is grieved so deeply. Lord, I know You are righteous, but why? Why do the wicked prosper? If you read the rest of that chapter, you find God doesn't answer him. But basically says, you think this is tough? Wait. He says, you got tired running with the footmen? Wait, do you have to run with the horses? And that's coming there, Jeremiah. I am bringing judgment, he says. You need to step up and follow me. You know, sometimes in our embracing of God's loving kindness and grace, we have made Him into Santa Claus. Santa Claus on demand. He is the Lord God Almighty. He is full of grace and mercy and gifts to us of blessing beyond our imagination. But we are His servants. We deserve nothing. Jesus said, hey, listen, a servant goes out and works in the field all day. And when he comes in, he doesn't sit down and say, oh, great, now feed me. No. He then feeds his master. We go out and do a couple of things for the Lord and we come back and go, oh, Lord, time for my Barco lounger. Tim was talking about this a little bit last week. You know, I just want to kick back. I just want to have my time alone. Okay, maybe the penguins will be there too, but time to myself. I need this, Lord. Certainly we need rest. And we are not called to drive ourselves to unhealthy behavior. But get it straight. You didn't sign up. You didn't enter in to a democracy. You entered into a kingdom. You don't get a vote. You don't. You get the opportunity to follow the Lord God Almighty and know that He is gracious and kind and loving. And know where you're headed. Psalm 37, jot that down and read it too. David deals with the same problem. And he says, hey, don't be boastful of the wicked. Don't be envious of them. Don't. Why? See where they're heading. See where you're heading. Enjoy the ride. It's an adventure. Don't think it's going to be smooth. Strap in. And the Lord will never leave you or forsake you. He will either move the mountain, lead you through the mountain, under the mountain, over top of the mountain. It's His choice, not ours. But He will never leave or forsake. Let's pray. Father God, thank You so much for Your goodness and Your grace. Thank You for the encouragement and the knowledge, Lord, that You have made the way for us and You will continue to make the way for us. Though the way is narrow and it is difficult, but Lord, You promise us strength and You promise us Your companionship. Oh, Lord. Sometimes walking with us. Sometimes pushing us. Sometimes carrying us. But You promise to always be there. Lord, I pray that You would help each one of us to have the full knowledge of that understanding of who You are. And that, Lord, You would, like You did with Asaph, give us eternal perspective to see our end and the end of the wicked that we might be encouraged in the difficult days. And now may the Lord God richly bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and grant you peace. 
May He lift up His countenance upon you and be gracious unto you every day of your life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our soon-coming King. Amen and amen. God bless you.